So thank you everybody for uh, joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Trey. I'll I'll be your um, MC, I guess for the <laughs> for the day. Also joined by Zoe. She's the Zoom tech. Um, so that's uh, that's the staff side of things. But thank you for joining us. The banking services away from home, and that's with Reed Achille with the Bank of America. And before we get started real quick, I'm just going to share, uh-oh, maybe, there we go, some additional resources here that are available with the Plano Public Library. Uh, you have a lot of business databases that are available um, through the library with your, accessible with your library card. You've got a number of things such as business insights, reference solutions, and value line, and many more uh, that may meet your business research needs. Uh, we also have LinkedIn Learning. And Udemy is a new product. It's very similar to LinkedIn Learning, if you're familiar with that. Um, both have resources to help you learn everything from Google Drive and Microsoft Office products and so many more uh, topics, as well as, of course, our physical and digital collections of uh, ebooks about investing. Some of our upcoming programs, uh, we have a reference solutions uh, database program on December 3rd. We also have a um, meeting facilitation uh, course on December 16th. So we hope hope those might be of interest and you can join us for those. And I am going to turn it over to Reed. Let me drop this off. Thank you so much. And I'll pull up my presentation. Let me see if I can make sure I stop sharing. You should be able to share over me, I think. I think it already dropped off. Yep. And I'm just grabbing mine. There we go. Okay. So thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, as Trey mentioned, my name is Rita Kelly. I'm with Bank of America, uh, and I am our chairperson for all financial literacy topics for North Texas. So I know we've done a lot of these, uh, particularly with the library, and I know this continues our series of getting people prepared for when they're going away to college. Uh, our last session was on the FAFSA, um, and just so you remember, the, uh, the FAFSA dates, the, the date to be able to fill out your application is December 1st this year, so a shortened time frame. So um, in a couple of weeks, if you are looking for a financial aid, make sure you fill out your FAFSA. Um, but this one's you know, the next part of the series, and this is talking about banking when you're away from home. Now, this obviously is geared towards students, but really the lessons here apply to anybody that's going to be away, you know, from their home for a little bit, especially, I you know, in this new environment, we're talking more and more about remote work and, and going on location versus, you know, kind of staying in the cozy confines of Plano and Collin County. Um, but really, we, want to, we, uh, we put together these. These are 10 questions to ask uh, when you're interviewing potential new banks or 10 things to think about if you are potentially considering um, whether or not you need to do a new bank while you're on a, a temporary uh, time away from home. You know, again, this is, is really geared towards, towards college students who are going to be four years away from the house and whether or not the bank that they use is appropriate. Um, I can say from personal experience, uh, and I didn't go that far away. I went to the University of North Texas up in Denton. Um, at the time, I did not bank with Bank of America, um, but can tell you at that time, there was not a branch. Um, I used Compass Bank at the time. There was not a branch in Denton. And uh, these were a lot of things that, that I could think about, you know, even changing. And like I said, it was a 45-minute drive. But really, once you start to realize how tied we are to, to our bank accounts, um, you know, how important it is to, to kind of think about these things and whether or not it makes sense to try to have a different provider when you're on those times away. So first and foremost, and I think this is the most important question right now, is does the bank have an online banking uh, website and a mobile app? Uh, right. Uh, for me right now, I can say that this is one of the most valuable things that I look for um, and recommend people to look for you know, when considering a financial institution. Um, I can't tell you the last time I have written a check, um, and I can't tell you the last time I kept 
uh, like cash money in my pocket. It's just something I don't do. Um, I try to use my uh, the the virtual wallet on my phone, um, you know, to pay for as much as possible, um, and do a lot of my banking, including bill pay, online and using the app. So this is one of the things that's that's really important for me to to have. Now, like I said, when we're talking about being away from home, maybe you can, you know, complete all of your your banking needs um, while away using uh, an app. Uh, and the website only, and if so, you know, that's that's one thing to check off. That's the most important thing for me. Um, so I know that's something to consider when, when you're looking. Uh, but if you are one of those people that's not comfortable having your entire financial life uh, live on your phone and on a website, you know, a lot of the next questions are really important. Um, so the second question, where are the bank's branches? Uh, like I told you from personal experience, um, I went to college in Denton at the time. Uh, they did not have a Compass Bank branch. Well, I don't think there's Compass Bank branches anymore. That, that bank went out of business. Um, but uh, at the time, they did not have a branch uh, in Denton. So uh, any of the times that I was up in Denton at school, um, you know, it was, you know, looking for an ATM, looking for a branch. You know, if I got a check, you know, like on book buyback day when they give you a check or on um, – uh, student loan day, when they, they give you the remainder of the funds that weren't applied towards your tuition balance, you have a big check, uh, and it would have been nice to be able to go deposit that check instead of driving around with it um, and potentially losing it. So really important, where are the bank's branches? And I think this really comes into play a lot more, um, especially these days. Uh, if you are going to a college that's significantly out of town, you know, multiple hours or even out of state. Um, again, using Bank of America as a reference, we are not present in every single state in the country. And so if it is a situation where you are going to have checks of significant size or additional needs that would require going to a branch, such as a safe deposit box um, or access to cashier's checks, that's one that I still use to this day. Um, like I said, I haven't written a physical check in years. So number two on my list is location of a bank branch because there are a the couple of times a year that I will need a cashier's check. Um, lucky for me, there's lots of Bank of Americas around, um, but that's one of those things. If you are away from home and do require some of those in-person services, knowing where the closest branch of the bank that you currently have um, is important to know as well, too. Um, that being said, a lot of times banks, particularly around college campuses, do know they kind of have a captive audience, and so they don't necessarily offer all of the best banking services just because they're there to capture everything and they're the closest. So as we go through all these questions, you know, these are 10 different things to, to think about and not necessarily in order of importance. Um, you should rank all of them in order of importance to you and help you make that decision on what's going to be the best. Um, the next one, what are the bank's fees? Um, and this is when you think anything from just a regular monthly maintenance fee to any fees for direct deposits, if there's any balance fees, um, if there's any uh, wire fee or, or recipient fees as well, too. I've seen some banks charge that. Um, now, again, if you're one of the parents of, of children going away to school, this is another one that's important to think about, especially if you are providing, you know, a monthly uh, addition or stipend or allowance uh, to your child that's away. If the account that they have charges a fee for any of those transfers or wires for them to receive, you know, that might be something to think about looking for a different, you know, potential uh, bank location uh, or or bank itself, right? Because obviously delivering money to your kids, you don't want to have to pay money to give away money. So when you are looking and interviewing those different options, make sure you get their schedule of fees and understand what that's going to entail. Kind of related, but not all the way, um, is the next one over a minimum balance requirement. Uh, a lot of times there is a minimum initial deposit requirement to open accounts. Um, and sometimes there is a requirement to maintain a certain balance uh, in your account. It's not necessarily a daily balance, but an average daily balance. 
Sometimes if it goes below a particular dollar amount, there could be additional fees that are incurred, uh, or it could be um, additional services that could be removed. Um, you know, again, kind of these two go hand in hand because um, sometimes fees get waived and the balance requirements get waived if you have direct deposit set up. Um, but then, you know, well, that, that's a little uh, look into the future, but, you know, direct deposit, you know, the ability to receive direct deposit without a fee is another one, um, you know, that's important, especially if there are going to be minimum balance requirements uh, or anything like that. Um, another one, very important, particularly for college kids, uh, is ATM usage free and which ATMs are free. So one of the perks that I have as a Bank of America employee, this isn't necessarily for Bank of America accounts, but as a Bank of America employee, I can use any ATM for free um, and it's through a rebate. So if another bank or another ATM charges a fee, uh, the uh, Bank of America sees that and they reimburse me for that. It, now it doesn't happen real time. I do have to pay for that up front. Um, but they do reimburse up to three um, non-Bank of America ATM transaction fees a month. Particularly around college campuses, this one is really important. Uh, you know, again, a lot of times, like we talked about, there will be banks that, you know, kind of set up and establish, you know, their ATM network around a campus and then minimize the services that they offer because they do have a captive audience and will only, you know, waive the fees for their their own or their quote in-network ATMs. Uh, another thing that's popular around college campuses, particularly around some of the uh, convenience stores or sundry stores are going to be private owned or third party ATMs that aren't affiliated with any particular bank. So with those, a lot of times what happens is they charge pretty high fees, but the individual ATM charges a fee and then your bank potentially could charge a separate fee. Um, so now you're looking at getting double feed. The other thing that I've seen, and I was actually um, up in Denton just this past weekend, um, but a lot of the ATMs around campus offer a lower withdrawal uh, amount. Uh, a lot of times you'll see mostly 20s, sometimes you'll see 10s. I actually saw an ATM this past weekend that offered withdrawals as low as $5, uh, but it had a $3 service fee attached to it. Um, and then for me, if I'm using an out-of-network ATM um, at Bank of America, it is $2. Yes, for me, that gets reimbursed. But if you're following along and you wanted to take out that minimum withdrawal, to withdraw $5 would have cost you $10, um, kind of using that example and if you're not getting reimbursed uh, for your fees. So that's another important thing is, is understand the area, look around and see what ATMs are available, what fees are associated with those ATMs, um, and what the minimum withdrawal amounts are. You know, to be able to make sure that you're not eating up all of your money um, in fees. Now, the reason why I break this out from the other fee categories uh, is because the other two are, are definitely kind of set maintenance fees that will hit monthly. Obviously, an ATM fee is only gonna apply if one, you use the ATM, uh, and two, the ATM is out of the bank network, uh, but I can definitely say uh, I have seen that, particularly if you go to some of the smaller towns. Um, uh, I know uh, there's a lot of University of Arkansas fans uh, in this part of town. Uh, I can tell you there is not a Bank of America in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and the only ATMs that I did see um, were for a small local bank. Now, I didn't get their schedule of fees, but now we're talking about, you know, a major, University of Arkansas is a major school that has significant enrollment. So it's also important to, to think that just because it's a, a larger school or in a big town that, you know, one of your major, you know, your JPMs, your Chase, your Bank of America, your Wells Fargo, um, even in those cases, there might not be representation in some of those smaller towns, uh, even in a large college city. So another thing to think about. Um, another one that's important here is, is uh, overdraft fees or what happens if I try to withdraw more than is in the account. Uh, again, very popular topic for college kids uh, who can, you know, pretty often 
I did it before when I was in college. I racked up a number of overdraft fees. Um, but a lot of banks offer different programs. You can either link your checking account to a credit card uh, or to another account that's there at the bank. So in case you do go over that particular amount that is in your checking account, you'll be able to cover that overdraft with another one of those options. Uh, but there are times if you do overdraft, they will charge you um, a fee on top of having to make it back up to being whole. Um, you know, so let's just go for an example. If you have $75 in your account, you withdraw $100. Um, now, if your bank lets you, right, obviously you'll be in the negative $25, so you'll have to make that up. But there are overdraft fees that range anywhere from $25 to $39. Uh, that I have seen as well. So now you're talking about, again, you know, kind of another one of those situations, you're looking at paying $65 just to cover a $25 shortfall. Um, another thing that can happen, particularly at some of the smaller banks, uh, is they will not let you complete the transaction if you try to withdraw uh, more than is in your account. But obviously that will come into trouble uh, if you're talking about paying rent or buying books or paying tuition. Um, so not only will you have that overdraft fee, because they're still going to charge you an overdraft fee even if they don't allow the transaction to go through, but now the merchant is potentially going to charge you a returned check fee and another overdraft fee. And if we're talking rent and you were, you know, rent's due on the first and then by the time they submitted the check and the check got returned, if it takes till the fifth or the sixth, now you're late on your rent and have a late fee there too. So understand what can happen, you know, whether or not they'll pay the check, what if there's any kind of overdraft fees, what that entails, how many days you have to get it back to hold. So that's another important one to think about. You know, I, I will say as a kid in college who was majoring in financial planning at the time, um, at no point up until then, and at no point during my college career did I receive a personal finance class, right? No one taught me how to budget, how to save, how to pick a bank, what, what fees could roll over, what late fees happen, how, a lot, how this could affect credit as well too, right? If you are late on your rent and your rent doesn't get applied, uh, rent is one of those things that does report to the credit agency. So now you eventually have a negative credit event uh, for uh, overdrawing your account. So a lot of things to factor and a lot of things to consider. And it's not a way of scaring people or, or telling you that you're doing it wrong. Um, it's just, it's something that's not out there. Uh, the, the Bank of America as a whole, uh, we did a survey uh, last year uh, of people that are in Generation X, so people age 18 to 24, right? And we wanted to know, you know, kind of what their biggest concerns were. Right, and so a couple of things that I found interesting in that survey was about a third of, of kids said that they had never received any formal financial uh, training or classes uh, regarding their personal finances. Uh, pretty much the majority of students said everything that they learned, they learned from a mentor, whether it be their parents, brother, sister, aunt or uncle, friend, something like that. So kids are saying that they did have a mentor and that they didn't learn it from school. But the final stat is, is over half of that population says that they don't think that they were prepared um, to lead their own financial life because of that lack of education. But at the same time, 85% uh, of the survey respondents said that they felt that they knew basic concepts such as budgeting. Um, so a lot of those stats don't make sense when you take them together. How they read to me is you've got a bunch of kids that are very confident uh, in their abilities and they've been somewhat exposed to it. Uh, but when they go out and have to make those decisions for themselves, uh, you kind of get that um, that shock, right, of, of, well, I've heard about this, but I don't know really what it means, and now I'm here having to make this decision. So by doing this, we're hoping to, to go through and, and, and help people, you know, 
understand that there are places where you can get this education um, and where you can get these questions answered, but also it's, it, it is an important decision to make, and it's not just a simple, I need an ATM card, let me go open a bank account, because it may or may not make sense. So now getting back into this, um, kind of speaking earlier, I know I kind of said I was going to give you a, a sneak preview here, but will it cost me to transfer money? Uh, again, a lot of the smaller banks and credit unions sometimes don't have the same uh, services that some of the larger banks offer. Uh, one of the best examples that I can think of here, again, sending money to kids. So at Bank of America, at a lot of the major banks, and even a lot of some of the smaller banks offer a service called Zelle. Um, it's similar to a, a Venmo or a PayPal or a Cash App. But what's different about Zelle, Zelle is actually the bank transfer network that a lot of the banks uh, subscribe to. So when a bank makes a money transfer, um, they use the same system that, that Zelle rides on. So if you have Zelle, it is a fast, cost-free way uh, to send money between uh, bank accounts, even accounts that are at different banks. But if they don't have Zelle, right, and you, you are sending uh, your, your child to a college that's out of state, uh, that doesn't have representation of the bank that you're a member of, and, and like I said, you want to make that you know, monthly or, or biweekly allowance payment, there might be a fee associated with that. So understand what that is going in, right? And does it make sense to open an account at a bank that's going to charge you to make a pretty regular um, deposit like you guys uh, potentially could do? Um, another one, uh, not necessarily so much checks. Uh, again, I, I know there are still people that write checks. Uh, I have not written a check in over 15 years, so I never have to pay for checks, but it's because I never use them. Uh, but debit cards, right? I've lost debit cards. I've sat on debit cards. I've broken debit cards. Um, and so it's important. Some banks may charge fees, right? And again, we're talking about college. I know how easy it is to lose a wallet, lose a debit card, misplace it um, while you're away. Uh, but is there going to be a fee associated with obtaining a replacement book of checks or a replacement card? That's another one uh, that's real important, especially as you're thinking about what are the most common things that can happen, um, you know, losing a wallet, uh, losing a phone, if you have one of those uh, pockets that magnetically attaches to the back of a phone, um, you know, just any of those things. If you're thinking about Picking a new bank, not all banks are made the same. So really understand all of the things that you could potentially get charged for. Uh, the next one, what's the interest rate? Some banks offer interest rate on checking accounts. Some have interest rates on, on savings accounts, right? If you are going to be using a potential savings account to complement uh, your checking account, um, what interest rate are they paying? I know at the major banks, our savings rate isn't the best, uh, but I know local to me, uh, there is a Bank of the Ozarks or, or Bank OZK is one that I've seen pop up recently, and they have a, a digital billboard outside of their building that says, hey, you know, open a new savings account, we're offering 4% money market savings, right? That's, that's better than we offer at Bank of America, but I also don't know uh, Bank OZK's uh, you know, requirements, right? So again, that's, that's important going in and will the potential interest rate that you're getting on saved money uh, be better than any kind of fees that are being um, levied on the account as well. So a lot of these um, factors may not necessarily directly relate, but all kind of tie together if you're talking about this, this recipe of choosing what account is appropriate for you. Um, and then finally, the tenth one is, does the checking account any offer any kind of rewards? Um, again, sometimes if you open a new account and establish a direct deposit or open a new account and maintain a particular um, account minimum for three months, but they offer um, bonuses or uh, increased savings interest rates or um, you know, additional potential free uh, ATM fees. But understanding any of the different kinds of rewards that can be offered to you, whether it's through a checking account, a savings account, or a combination of the both, um, and whether or not uh, it could potentially reward you for any activities, right, such as direct deposits, purchases, transfers, right, those are all things 
that are important to look for. And particularly, these are the things that you see more and more in some of the smaller banks, right? They're trying to attract customers um, and don't necessarily have the same presence or features as larger banks. So a lot of times that they do that is through higher interest rates or rewards programs, uh, but it is very important to not be distracted by just the rewards program or just the interest rate, but understand how all of those different parts tie in together. Um, and then, like I said, when it comes down to it, maybe maintaining your existing account is what's good for you, uh, but you're not going to know that until you know you go to the actual campus, you commit to the campus, you see what the options are, and see what's going to be best for you. Now, that being said, I know I've been talking a lot here. Um, I would love to open it up for any questions that people may have, whether it's on banking away from home, uh, like I said, I know that we talked about the FAFSA last time, uh, or any other questions that you may have, uh, I'd love to give you that opportunity. Yeah, we do have a question here, uh, and the question was, why would you use a debit card instead of a credit card? Credit cards have a lot of security features built in, which uh, debit cards don't. That is a fantastic question. Um, and so, debit cards, if they are, you know, MasterCard or Visa branded uh, debit cards, um, a lot of times do offer the same protections as some of those credit card purchases. Now, they're not going to offer um, the same like travel insurance, uh, things like that. Uh, but a lot of times they do offer the same, you know, no hassle returns. You can, you can um, contest certain charges. Um, but then particularly if we're talking about college kids, right, they may not necessarily have a credit card that they could pay on, or they may not have the balance, or, and again, I'm guilty of this as well too, as a college kid, uh, a lot of times my credit cards were maxed out, right? And so I wasn't necessarily the most responsible with my credit card. And so um, particularly as you are new to the finance world and kind of being responsible for yourself, um, I would recommend paying as much as possible directly from a, a checking balance. You know, either you're using cash, you're using Zelle, um, you're using a, a payment directly using your debit card uh, because a lot of times you can't spend more than you have. I know that we talked about overdraft fees earlier. Um, I've set up my account to reject any purchase that goes over a, a balance that I have because I don't want to make myself subject to those overdraft fees. Uh, so it is a good question. If you do have the responsibility um, to, to use a credit card, if you have a credit card, or if your parents provide you with a credit card to use for purchases, um, that's a good option as well. Uh, but I would say that if you are, this is your first time out on your own and you don't have those backstops, then I would recommend using a debit card uh, to not run up a credit balance that you don't necessarily need to be accumulating at that time. But very good question. You know, while, while I'm on that topic, one of the things that I'll say that's changed for the good, um, when I was in college, you know, again, talking about people just kind of establishing credit and not having it before, um, credit card companies were allowed to set up tables and take credit applications of students just walking through campus um, at, at North Texas. Um, when I was there, I signed up for a card because they gave you a coupon for a free Subway sandwich if you signed up for the card. Right? They didn't have instant decisions on site, but you filled out an application. I got a coupon as a poor, hungry college kid. I got a free lunch out of it. Um, and then, as I mentioned in the other part of my story, a couple weeks later, I did get a credit card. I maxed it out pretty much almost instantly. And then now I've got, now I've got a debt. I've got another bill that I have to take care of um, because I did go out and spend money. Credit cards make it very easy, especially for young users to spend money that they don't have um, because you're not actually, you know, dealing with the money, you know, directly coming through. You're not counting it out like cash 
and you're not seeing it real time be depleted from your account like you would with the debit card purchase. What other questions? So far, no one else has, has typed in a, a question. Okay. Well, then, so independently, you know, kind of, you know, away from talking about how to choose an account, um, understanding, you know, particularly while you're at school, you know, some, some financial decisions that could come your way. You know, one of the things I talked about at the beginning, you know, was about getting a student loan, talking about filling out the FAFSA, um, so a lot of times what happens is you will get a loan for greater than the amount of money that you need to pay your tuition and buy books. And so you will have extra money left over. They issue that in the form of a check from the bursar. Um, the way that financial aid is, is calculated it is not just tuition and books. It's also room and board it's also you know potential dependent care depending on what your exact situation is and how you fill out the fafsa they they you are you are given student loans based on your entire economic need and so if you have that extra money um that's not money to it's not tax return right it's not lottery it's not bonus money it is money that is calculated as part of your kind of ongoing financial need so particularly when you're in college, I know some of those small hits of money can, can feel really great and feel like, you know, a birthday present or a lottery win. But do know that if you are going to school full time and, and you're not working full time, right, your income is going to be a little bit lower. And some of those other sources, you know, it could help, you know, to know just because you got it right now doesn't mean you need to turn around and spend it. Uh, same thing comes with end of semester um, when you go to sell back your books. You know, a lot of times you'll get a pretty good uh, little bit of money, uh, and that doesn't mean to turn around and go go blow it because, you know, coming up the next semester, you know, you're going to have another round of books to buy. So any bit of, of that money that you can save, you know, that comes in, particularly when you're a student, um, you know, it's really important to make sure that you have the discipline to forecast out a little bit in the future and see what those, those cash needs are going to be. And so when you do get those, you know, those small wins, those small pockets of money, you know, make sure that you're not benefiting yourself today at the cost of not being able to, to pay rent tomorrow. Yeah, still, still no other questions at the moment. Surely there's a good question y'all are dying to ask. Now's your chance. And it doesn't just have to be on the topic today. Any question? Do you have, this is a little different, but uh, do you have like investment advice for people in their 20s? So investment advice, if you're just getting started out, uh, the best and easiest place to start is going to be your employer's retirement plan. Um, it, it happens automatically, right? So you don't have to worry about making those contributions. Uh, a lot of employers offer a match. So mm -hmm. that's the best return. If you put in $5 and they put in $5, that's 100% return um, just for contributing. So you're not really going to get that anywhere else. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're talking about actual investments to make, if you are young and getting started out, the best advice that I could make is get the lowest cost uh, index fund possible. Okay. Right. Um, 
you know, a lot of times if you're watching, you know, CNBC or you're hearing people talk about, oh, the stock market returns X percent a year. Mm -hmm. The only way to do that is to actually get the stock market, right? And that's what index funds represent is, you know, the, the totality of the stock market. So if you're just getting started out, right, think about it, the S&P 500, the 500 means there's 500 individual stocks that make it up. Okay. So if you're just getting started out, it would be really hard to buy 500 individual stocks. Yeah. And so the best way to get full exposure to the stock market is to buy an index fund. Um, and like I said, buy the lowest cost one possible. So that way you'll know that you will get the return of the S&P every year. Um, just, you know, obviously you want to pay the lowest fee to do it. Mm -hmm. And then there's a lot of variability. Um, on those ETFs and exchange and uh, mutual funds that, that are index based. So um, you really have to do read the fine print, but you can do any online search. You know, I actually did it myself. Um, I established an account for my daughter and searched for low cost index fund and, and found a couple of options. So right. that would be my number one piece of advice for anybody getting started is get as broad and as cheap as possible. Okay. Thank you. Of course. Good question. Any other yearning burning questions? Now's your chance. Oop, here's one. Can you talk about disadvantages of using Zelle? Excellent question. Excellent question. I should have covered that um, before, but I know that that's been, we've seen some stories of that in the news too. So Zelle, Zelle doesn't have the same recourse. You know, we, we had gotten the question about credit cards earlier. So Zelle does not have the same recourse as some of the other money transfer options. Um, with Zelle, once you send that money, it is gone. Um, once you hit send, it's gone, it's out of your account, it goes into the other account. Um, when you use Zelle, there's a couple of ways that you identify the person that you're sending the money to. Uh, most often it's phone number, but it can be email address or username. Um, so it is crucially important that when you're typing in those Zelle recipients that you get that phone number, that email address, that username exactly right. And even, uh, you know, make sure whenever I use Zelle, I make sure that I'm standing right next to the person that I am Zelling. And so if it's somebody new that I've never done before, I type in the number, I ask them to make sure that that's the number. Then when I send it, I stand there with them until you know it hits and again zelle is very quick um and so that's that's one of the options that you have there is to be able to stand there and watch as it as it hits their account and post to their account um but if you mistype a phone number there's no oh wait i mistyped a phone number i want to do that um so with zelle be really careful when you type in uh, especially a new a new recipient, make sure that you get that number exactly right. Um, because once the money is sent, it is sent. That is one of the downsides of Zelle um, is there's not a lot of recourse to recall the transaction if a mistake is made. Um, I have a question if no one else has one. Um, just I was just curious about how relevant credit scores are to this generation as opposed to, because I feel like there was more importance previously as opposed to now, or is that wrong? No, I think credit scores are important and they're always going to be important. 
uh, right? And so particularly as you're making these decisions now, the better and healthier credit habits you can have, the better it's going to serve you long term. So prior to age 18, I mean, everybody has a credit score. If you have a social security number, you technically have a credit score, but you cannot enter into a credit contract uh, until you're 18 years of age. So a lot of times when you're, you, you turn 18 um, and there is, you know, there's a, there's a lot of surprising places that look at credit scores, right? Car insurance, uh, if you're renting an apartment, um, you know, when you are applying for those first credit cards, right, they're all going to be looking at, at credit score and making sure that you can make those decisions. So it is important and something that, that should be watched, it shouldn't be shunned. Um, but, you know, the easiest ways to build credit are, are to start small, right? So um, looking at a prepaid card that reports to credit agencies, right? Prepaid cards are, are a little, they're, they're, they're a little odd, right? They, they feel like a, they feel like a gift card, right? And essentially you give a bank money and they give you a credit card with that limit. The thing is, is that's collateral. That's not a balance that you draw down on. So let's say you get a prepaid card and give the bank $500, you have a $500 limit credit card. So if you spend $300, they're gonna send you a bill, they're gonna charge you interest, um, and you have to pay that, mm -hmm. right? And that's, that's one of the good ways to build credit is to kind of start small with one of those prepaid cards because you know you can't get yourself into too much trouble. But at the same time, understand that a prepaid card is not a gift card. Um, and make sure that you pay those bills on time. But anything else that could help if you have a car loan where you have a parent as a co-signer, if you have an apartment lease with a parent as a co-signer, um, then you start to, then you'll need, you know, utilities, right? Light, um, water, internet, yeah. cell phone. If you're on your own plan, all of those report to credit agencies. They have low barriers of entry. Right, it's really easy mm -hmm. for anybody that's 18 to go get a new cell phone line, but if you don't pay your bill, now it's going to start affecting your credit score. And so, as you leave college and look, or, or even when you're in college, if you want to move into a bigger apartment, if you get a better job, if um, you know you want to start shopping car insurance, if you have a bad credit score, right, it's going to affect your ability to get new services. So. It is important. You don't necessarily have one or, or, or a good one at 18, uh, but it is important that you start making those those habits because I will say uh, charge-offs, late pays, those ways, those, those have ways of sticking to your credit report right. uh, and thus your credit score for a while. Um, so especially as you're getting started out, you want to make sure that you don't overextend yourself mm -hmm. because that is the that is the quick path to being on the wrong side of, of the credit score game. Right. A good question. Yep. Thank you. And curious, back in, in my past, I had done a personal loan with a bank that my dad had to co-sign. And years, years later, it didn't dawn on me at the time to to verify. It just they needed a co-signer and I didn't ask enough questions. But years later, I'm looking through my credit you know, history. And that was never counted. Come to find out they counted it on my dad's credit history, but not mine, even though I got the bill, it was all in my name and I made the payback on the, on the loan. Is that common yeah. now? Or is that just something from the past? So I can't say that it's common. Uh, it's, so the banking industry comes in waves, right? So uh, I don't necessarily know the time that you took out that loan, uh, but I can say I know 10 years ago, one of the ways that was kind of a, a, a hack, if you will, a trick to get a better credit score was if your parents put you as an authorized user on their credit card, 
their credit history then got applied to you uh, as it relates to that card. So every time they paid, if there was a high balance, um, it would be negative to you. But if, let's say, they paid it and charged it off every month, now you're getting all of this great credit history, um, this low credit usage, and it was very positively impacting you know, teenagers who were put on as authorized users. Now what I've seen more and more of is there's kind of an opt-out, if you will, um, where or, or an opt-in, where you have to opt into reporting it to all, the, all of the authorized users um, versus it automatically being done. So I, I think you made a good point there. Ask a lot of questions, read the fine print, uh, because if you are doing something strictly for the purpose of bettering a credit score, you know, make sure it's actually doing that for you, um, you know, versus, you know, something that a different product would, would do better. Yeah, this was well past 30 years ago. So <laughs> very, very small rural local bank. So gosh knows what they were doing. Gotcha. Yeah. And, and particularly that, that brings up a good point, particularly with smaller local banks, you know, they have, some of the more odd, you know, terms and not necessarily odd of why would you think of that, but obviously they're a small bank with all, with very limited recourse against any, you know, uh, bad loans that they may have. So a lot of times there will be provisions in there that not necessarily are confusing, but you're like, well, what bank would do this? And the bank that would do that is a small bank that couldn't necessarily take on a lot of the risk for any potential bad loans. So particularly if you're going away and looking at some of those smaller banks, make sure, make, make double sure that you're reading the fine print on those. Okay. We well, can take the silences. We did a good job. So thank you all for joining. We appreciate you coming. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll give it, we'll give it, you know, one more, more ask out, but uh, otherwise, you know, we appreciate your time today and hope everybody has a good Thanksgiving. And thank you, Reed. Uh, appreciate you uh, presenting for us today. Thank you so much. I learned a few things myself. A lot of things I should have done differently 30 years ago. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> of course. Thanks, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Bye.